Continuing on with the TMCC Library Outstanding Guest Speaker Series, today we are pleased to present Jennifer Bodina and Kirsten Laclede. Um, Jennifer is a museum director, excuse me, Jennifer is a museum educator at the National Army Museum where she focuses on developing content for educators and students. Prior to joining the museum, she worked at the National Museum of African American History and Culture, Arlington House, the Robert E. Lee Memorial, and the Sagamore Hill National Historic Site in New York. She earned a Master of Arts degree in Public History from the American University. Kirsten is a museum educator at the National Museum of the United States Army. She received her Bachelor's in Historic Preservation from the University of Mary Washington in Fredericksburg, Virginia, and is less than a week away from finishing her Master's degree in Museum Studies from George Washington University in Washington, DC. She has worked at a variety of museums and historic houses around Virginia, and has been at the, at the Army Museum since December. Kirsten has a particular passion for material culture and telling the stories of people through artifacts and teaching collections. In regards to today's presentation, the Civil War consumed the United States from 1861 to 1865. Tens of thousands of soldiers endured hardships and challenges to carry out the Army's military mission to preserve the Union. The items soldiers carried into the field were invaluable to performing their duty and executing the Army's mission. Today, we will explore the gear, weapons, and personal items that made up the Civil War soldiers' load. So I'd like to offer a warm virtual welcome to Jennifer and Kristen. Thank you so much for having us. I think it's just me today. Jen's little one was sick, so stuck with me for the afternoon. But thank you so much for having me. Um, like I said, my name is Kirsten. I'm an educator here at the National Museum of the United States Army. Uh, thank you so much for attending this virtual field trip today on the Civil War Soldiers Load. Uh, today I'm broadcasting from the National Army Museum in Fort Belvoir, Virginia, about 20 minutes south of Washington, D.C. Our mission is to tell the history and traditions of America's oldest military service, the United States Army, by displaying artifacts and sharing the stories of soldiers. So for our program today, we're going to focus on one specific aspect of the Army, the individual soldier. Throughout American history, Army soldiers have carried what is known as the soldier's load. So to start us off and get us thinking, let me ask you guys, what do you think that means, the soldier's load? What does it make you think of? Feel free to put your answers in the chat. You may see some of these items on the screen here, boots, yes. Gun, yes, also very important to the soldier's load. What they had to carry, exactly. Uniform, rations, very good. Bedding, yes, or similar things to bedding. Backpack with food and clothes, exactly. All right, all great answers and all things that I'm going to touch on. Medicine occasionally, yes. So you guys are touching on it exactly. So the soldier's load is the weapons, uniform, equipment, and supplies that soldiers use on a daily basis. Soldiers use each of their load items to accomplish the Army's mission, whether that's engaging the enemy in battle, marching across rough terrain, or even grabbing a bite to eat. Soldiers have always carried a quote-unquote load, but what they carried has varied throughout the Army's history and is based on the time, the mission at hand, and the needs of the particular soldier. Today, we'll examine the Civil War and their soldiers' load items. These soldiers had the difficult mission of preserving the United States, and their items helped to accomplish that mission. We will also see how these items were improved by technological advances to ensure the mission's success. Today, I'll highlight just a few of those things and some of the stories behind them. So before we get too far into the soldiers' load, let's briefly review some details and background on the Civil War. The Civil War is the deadliest conflict in American history with over 600,000 people dying from various causes throughout the conflict. Abraham Lincoln was elected president in 1860, and during his campaign, he ran on an anti-slavery platform and advocated slowly getting rid of slavery over time. Many Southerners whose entire way of life was based on the system of slavery saw this as a threat. As a result, 11 Southern states seceded or left the United States to form the Confederate States of America. Each state that left the Union wrote in Articles of Secession that outlined their reasons for leaving the United States. All 11 states identified slavery as the root cause for leaving the Union. For example, this quote from the Mississippi Articles of Secession that you see on your screen says, our position is thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery, the greatest material interest in the world. Its labor supplies the product, which constitutes by far the largest and most important portions of commerce of the earth. So simply put, 
the abolition of slavery was the primary cause that made Southern states secede from the Union. Now, several army forts were located in the South, including Fort Sumter, which is just outside of Charleston, South Carolina. And it's known for being the site of the first battle of the Civil War. On April 12, 1861, Confederates fired on the Union garrison of Fort Sumter, and the army received a new mission to defeat the Confederacy. Now, to do that, the army needed soldiers. President Lincoln called for volunteers, and hundreds of thousands answered the president's call to enlist. Over 2.6 million men would serve in the US Army, and most of them were volunteers. And they were young. It was, they were the average age of 24, which is actually how old I am, uh, but most of them were under 21. They mostly came from small farming communities in the North and did not have a lot of military experience. So you guys wanna kind of think back to when you guys were in school, do you ever try to join a sports team or a club with friends in your neighborhood or in your classes? That's kind of what it was like to enlist or join in the army. A group of your friends and neighbors would organize and join together. Together, your group makes up what's called a regiment. This is a group of soldiers, typically from the same location, working together. We see a few of these regiments on your screen here. Uh, this is a picture of the 110th Pennsylvania. And then this one is the 4th United States Colored Troops, or USCTs. It would be up to these men to execute the Army's mission. And it would be up to the Army to ensure that these soldiers had the equipment they needed to carry out this mission. So let's talk a little bit about Civil War soldiers. When we think about a soldier today, images that come to mind might be those from movies or some soldiers that you may personally know. We might think of soldiers carrying lots of heavy equipment, riding in tanks, living on army posts. During the Civil War, the army expanded from a few thousand soldiers to nearly two million men. However, these soldiers weren't stationed on army posts, in barracks, or in houses. Rather, they lived in camps, which were generally outdoors, and if they were lucky, they slept in tents. They were constantly on the move, heading to or from a battle. As a result, soldiers needed to carry everything they needed to survive including food, clothing, and other equipment to protect themselves from the elements and weapons to defend themselves and carry out their mission. So every single item a soldier carried was designed for a specific purpose to accomplish the Army's mission. Today we'll look at a few of those items, learn more about what soldiers carried with them. We'll see that everything had a purpose and learn how the Army was constantly innovating to ensure its soldiers had the equipment they needed to accomplish their mission. Now, imagine you're a soldier in the Civil War. What kinds of things do you need to carry with you other than your weapons? Any thoughts? And feel free to put them in the chat again. Food, yes, there are no grocery stores anywhere near. What else do we see in this soldier that he's carrying? Water, yes, always important to have a water bottle with you or as I describe it, my emotional support water bottle. <laughs> Ammo, yes, ammo is also very important. We won't touch on that too much today, but they definitely did have to carry ammo. So soldiers basically had to carry their food, their clothing, their blankets, and various essential items, kind of like what you guys touched on. We're gonna watch a short video so we can see just what the soldiers, uh, the soldiers load looked like when it was all put together. My slide would advance, there we go. Give me just a second. There we go. Hello, my name is Tony, and I'm an educator here at the National Museum of the United States Army. Today, I'm here to talk to you about the Civil War soldiers' load, or the weapons, uniforms, and equipment the Civil War soldiers used during the battle. First, we'll take a look at my uniform. This is the typical uniform a Civil War soldier would have worn during the war. My uniform is mostly made of wool and it has four main pieces: my forage cap, sack coat. Sky blue trousers, Rogan boots. Along with my uniform, I also carried a variety of other objects, including my weapon, which was a rifled musket, my food and many personal items, which I carried in my haversack, as well as my knapsack, which I took with me on marches, which carried my blanket, spare clothing, and my shelter. As you can see, the Civil War soldier carried a variety of items and needed to, to be well equipped to face the harsh conditions they faced on and off the battle. All right, so I see a question, do all the educators dress in period costume? We do not, unfortunately. So this is one of our reenactors who occasionally come uh, to the museum and he did this for us. 
Um, whether or not you dress in period costume kind of depends on the museum. Fun fact, I actually used to, I used to work at an 18th century house museum and I wore a petticoat. That was a very fun time in my life. So unfortunately we don't all get to dress in period costumes, but we do get to work with uh, materials from the teaching collection. All right. There we go. So now that we know what a soldier had overall, let's focus on their food. Now, first, why is food important? Now, food will give you energy, it prevents and can treat disease, and increases morale. And all these are important to maintaining a solid fighting force. So how does the army make sure they're eating correctly? They issue rations. A ration is the amount of food authorized for one soldier per day. So it's all the food the army thinks one soldier needs in a single day to have enough energy to complete their mission. So soldiers were issued rations daily, but how did they carry and store it? How did they ensure they stayed dry and protected them from bugs, water, and animals? The answer is the haversack. Now, this is a haversack. Uh, it not only stored their food, but also kept small personal items safe and dry. Knowing that soldiers were consistently exposed to the elements and harsh conditions, the army had to figure out how to feed these soldiers every day for years. Before the Civil War, the haversack was just made of linen and it didn't provide protection from water. By the Civil War, these haversacks were painted in tar and linseed oil to add a layer of water protection to the bags, which was a huge technological innovation. They were also a standard issue, meaning the army gave every soldier a haversack. This was something that Revolutionary War soldiers didn't have. These were essential items for every soldier in the field and were constantly worn by soldiers just around their shoulder by the strap. Now, each soldier had their own unique way of carrying food, including uh, various bags. Soldiers had their own version, like how you can bring a sandwich bag for lunch. Uh, in here, we have various bags, including uh, coffee, rice, utensils, other dishware bags. Bread, meat, and coffee were the staples of the diet, uh, with beans, rice, or dried vegetables added occasionally. During active campaigning, the soldier got little more than the staples unless he foraged, which was when the soldier would hunt for food and find food like berries or crops nearby. Hardtack was the bread issued most frequently, and along with coffee, it formed the basis of most soldiers' diets. I have a piece here. So this is hardtack. Um, it's the bread that was most frequently issued. Um, and again, it, was, it formed the basis of their diets. It is a thick cracker made of flour, water, and sometimes salt. When appropriately stored, hardtack would last for years. Hardtack was so hard, I can't even like break it. It had to be dipped in liquid, preferably coffee, to be edible. Now the simple pleasure that food brought to soldiers is captured in this quote that you see on the screen here from William Woodland of the 8th USCT, where he says, nothing for breakfast this morning but coffee. The rations were issued this afternoon and we were once more in good spirits with plenty to eat. Overall, the haversack allowed the army to feed soldiers better and sustain combat operations in the field. Soldiers knew they had a durable sack to keep their food and other essential items dry while on the march. So now that we've covered food, shelter is also necessary for a soldier. As I mentioned earlier, Civil War soldiers were often on the move or spent most of their time in camp where they drilled and passed the time. There were no large army posts like you see today with buildings to protect them from the rain, snow, cold, and heat. They lived outside, often in tents, in all seasons. So if it was raining like it is here in Virginia today, it's absolutely downpouring outside. A soldier was outside, hopefully with the protection of a tent. They also didn't have beds, um, or even more importantly for our purposes, they didn't really have a place to store their belongings. So soldiers had to carry oversized items with them wherever they went, like their tent, their blankets, extra clothes, and a poncho. Soldiers had to carry a lot of equipment wherever they went. In addition to a haversack, uh, soldiers would put a more, more oversized items in a knapsack. As you can see, it's very large, it's very hard for me to carry. The items can be numerous and extremely heavy. The average load of this equipment weighed about 50 pounds and soldiers would wear it kind of just like a backpack. Army knapsacks were made of canvas or cotton linen and waterproofed like the haversacks. There were several variations of knapsacks throughout the war, 
However, all of them developed a reputation for not being very comfortable. This is how it opens, and you can see how they could fold up and carry different items. While all of these are important, I wanted to show you one of the soldiers' most valuable items, which is their gum blanket. Now, rubber ponchos and blankets were some of the most important items carried by Civil War soldiers. Rubber ponchos and blankets were just that. Ponchos and blankets made from a light fabric like cotton, which was then coated with rubber on one side, um, as coating with both sides can make the blanket a little bit too heavy. Over 1.8 million rubber blankets were bought or made by the army over the course of the Civil War. Soldiers would also often cut a slit or hole in their blankets and use them as a poncho when needed. Gum ponchos and blankets came about through the process of vulcanizing rubber. So this includes mixing clean raw rubber with white lead and sulfur before it's spread on a piece of cloth and led to dry. Vulcanizing rubber made it stronger, more flexible, and more resistant to various environmental conditions. Gum blankets and ponchos protected soldiers from inclement weather, the cold, and from sleeping on the muddy ground. This technological innovation vastly improved what the army had used in prior conflicts. Now here we have this soldier here, and you can see his gum blanket is rolled up over his knapsack on the ground. A firsthand account of rubber ponchos and gum blankets comes from William Wilbur F. Hinman, excuse me, who was a captain in the 65th Ohio Volunteer Infantry. In his book, he says, they were mighty good to spread on the ground under your blanket. You know wet won't soak through the rubber. And when you're marching in the rain, it beats an umbrella. Hinman's experiences, while told through the eyes of fictional characters, presents us with a realistic picture of army life and why rubber blankets and ponchos were much sought after items. Now, waterproofing, especially regarding knapsacks, haversacks, and ponchos and blankets, was a significant technological advance of the era that supported the Army's mission and helped maintain soldiers' health and their morale as well. On the soldier you see on your screen here, we also see another load item that's important to the soldier, their clothing. Clothing has a purpose, and a soldier's uniform serves a specific purpose. These uniforms identify them as soldiers. They also serve practical purposes keeping soldiers cool or warm. Uh, today, they even help soldiers blend into their environment with camouflage. As I mentioned earlier, much of a Civil War soldier's time was spent on the move from one location to another. Unlike soldiers today who use vehicles, tanks, and other vehicles to move along long distances, Civil War soldiers marched on foot, walking miles between camp and the battlefield. Soldiers would march around 10 miles a day when moving from battlefield to battlefield. So when walking a lot, Keeping your feet in good condition is incredibly important. So one of the most important parts of a soldier's uniform was his boots. So soldiers primarily wore a shoe called a broken boot. These shoes were first used in battle by the English and they were used by both sides during the American Revolution. By 1851, brogans became the standard issue for soldiers due to their durable nature. They were made of leather and the soles were nailed or like our example, they're pegged to the shoe. You can kind of see the small little dots, that's the pegging. Industrial pegging machines allowed these shoes to be mass manufactured, so almost every soldier could be issued a pair. This was also a huge technological innovation. Now, compared to the shoes that we wear today, these shoes actually weren't all that comfortable, and they often weren't the correct size either. Some, like our pair, were straight-laced, meaning it wasn't formed for the left or the right foot. Now, even though uh, it improved over the shoes of the revolution, the broken fruit really did not perform well, uh, especially in the mud. When it rained during the Civil War, most dirt roads became very mucky. Brogans were no match for the mud. It would slosh over the sides of the shoes, sticking to the soldier's feet. Occasionally, soldiers would lose a shoe in the mud. I have a quote here from Charles H. Lynch from the 18th Connecticut Volunteers. He says, while the weather is fine, the mud is very thick and plenty of it. A large quantity will stick to one's feet, or rather to our army brogans, as we attempt to walk. This all comes in the life of a soldier. We are not serving our country for pleasure. Keeping on the theme of feet, socks are going to be another valuable clothing item for soldiers. Clean and dry socks were very essential. Wet feet meant disease and injuries, which meant slower moving trees. The army wanted to keep its soldiers healthy and mobile. Socks were in short supply and often very hard to come by, along with the troubles of socks being destroyed or worn out from overuse. One way soldiers were able to get more socks was from back home. 
Many women on the home front, while they were also operating farms and businesses, helped by creating supplies soldiers needed by hand. Women knitted socks, mittens, and bandages, among other items, to send to soldiers in the front. In all, shoes and socks were vital to the Army mission because, without durable boots and enough socks, soldiers wouldn't have been able to march from battlefield to battlefield effectively. Now, one final thing I want to talk about, we've talked about food, we've talked about shelter, we've talked about clothing. But what is another item important to soldiers? Their weapon. Soldiers needed a weapon to defend themselves from the enemy and to advance in battle. Now, most soldiers had a musket as their primary weapon, but today, which I'm very excited to show you, and actually one of my favorite items, is the sword. Swords are some of the oldest weapons in human history, and I have an example of one here from the Civil War. Now, I know what you guys are probably thinking. Didn't they use guns during the Civil War? What are the swords doing here? Well, the answer is yes, they did use swords. They did use guns, but there were also swords. Swords were a powerful weapon, but rarely used as a literal combat weapon. Swords or bayonets caused only about 2% of all combat wounds in the Civil War. However, the swords stood out because they acted as potent symbols of authority in battle, giving their leaders the tools to stand out and inspire. Officers with swords on the battlefield often provided soldiers with an easily recognizable authority figure, helping inspire them to fight in battle to accomplish the Army's mission. Now, this sword is a Model Ames 1861 Staff and Field Officer Sword. This sword is a 32-inch steel infantry weapon designed for mounted soldiers. I can get a little bit closer because it's very ornate and pretty. Officers leading infantry regiments use this style of swords in large quantities, and it's one of the more common swords you're going to see by Army officers. Now, again, as you can kind of see, it's very befitting for officers, very ornate. The blade and brass guard are all etched with foliage, and the entire sword is actually covered in patriotic symbols like U.S., E Pluribus Unum, and Eagles. The hitch has wired spirals over shark skin for grip, uh, and it, the apple-shaped pommel is double protected with a fine etching of vines and U.S. in brass. Make no mistake, while it's very ornate and very pretty, it still is a very deadly weapon. Now, to accomplish their mission, soldiers needed to follow orders. But battles during the Civil War are going to be loud, confusing, and chaotic. Officers in the Civil War didn't have the benefit of phones, so they had to deliver orders without sound. So officers often used their swords to convey their orders visually. The sword in hand and thrust forward, like you can see in the image on the right of your screen here, uh, it's something that can be easily seen and understood. And the sword also symbolizes their leadership to inspire their men to be brave in the face of danger. One of the most significant examples of an officer using their sword in the Civil War comes from Robert Goldshaw, Colonel of the 54th Massachusetts, who use an uh, image you see on the screen here. The 54th was a segregated unit of United States Colored Troops. On July 18th, 1863, Shaw led his men to attack the Confederate-held Fort Wagner. As the 600 men approached the fort, the Confederate defenders opened fire. Dozens of them fell wounded or killed. The attack stalled beneath the fort's parapet for a moment as the men tried to shelter themselves from enemy fire. So this was when Shaw, at the head of his men, raised his sword and shouted, forward, 54th forward, which is the image that you see here on the right. And these are going to be his last words. As he surged forward, enemy fire hit Shaw several times, but his men pushed forward into the fort. They tied down the Confederate defenders and bought time for other units to advance. Though ultimately defeated, Shaw led by example with his sword, inspiring his men to push on. So in short, to kind of cover everything I've uh, talked about in the past uh, 20 minutes or so, soldiers during the Civil War carried many items with all. This was just a very small portion of them. Um, and all of these items contributed to a Union victory. And that's about all I have for you guys today. Um, I know we've covered a lot in a short period of time and I've shown a lot of different things. Uh, did you guys have any questions for me, curiosities? Okay, um, I'll open the, the floor to the students and just unmute your microphones and ask the question directly of our guest speaker. Sure, yeah, feel free to shout them out, put them in the chat, whatever you guys are most comfortable with. And while we're waiting for a few, call, uh, few questions to come in, uh, I have a couple questions. At the end of their service, did they have to return the items that were issued to them back to the military? Um, not to my knowledge, no. I'd have to double check on that, but I think most of them 
uh, would keep them. Um, I believe for the most part, they did keep them. Okay. And then um, a couple years ago, um, I actually baked some hardtack at home and brought it in and shared it with the class, just, <laughs> kind of, just so they can hold it in their hand. Yeah. And it was it was incredibly, I, I thought, well, of course, I'm not a, a really good cook here, I'll be honest with you, but I thought it was kind of hard to make. I mean, because you had to roll the dough and then you had to cut it and then you had to bake it. And, you know, it's yeah, that's, I've had a couple of colleagues who've made it. I don't think it's easy. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyhow, but yes, hardtack, if you've never held it in your hand, I encourage you to, to go in and, and actually hold it in your hand. It's just so hard. I mean, like you can never bite through it. I mean, yeah, it's, it's right. just, it's you break a tooth. <laughs> yeah. It really could. Yeah, it's definitely need to dip it in coffee. I think there's a pretty famous book that was published after the Civil War. I think it was called Hardtack and Coffee. I think it was. Yeah, I think it's Hardtack and Hard Times. Yeah, maybe that's what it's titled. I, think that's what it is. Hard yeah. I do have a question. So sure. if anyone had a sword, they were generally officers in correct. command, correct? Correct. Okay. That answers a huge question for me. We've been wondering why my great great grandfather had a sword and nobody wanted to open the sheath to find out what was inside. And I felt pretty sure that based on my knowledge of military history, you were issued a sword when you attained the rank of an officer and are in command. So that uh, was my understanding. Comment here from Dave Perdue from Sons Union Veterans of the Civil War. Um, in the cavalry, typically NCOs would also have swords um, and, and sometimes soldiers in the cavalry would have swords as well. Not so much in infantry or artillery, but definitely cavalry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, officers and mounted soldiers on the cavalry, typically. Well, since he wasn't in the cavalry, I, you know, I, I feel sure it was because he was promoted to a first lieutenant and then a second lieutenant. Very interesting. We love finding swords in people's <laughs> Yeah, we, we have it in the family and have had it. Ever That's since. very cool. <laughs> so we still have it. <laughs> And then, and then um, Kristen, there is somebody in the chat box that said that they couldn't see your artifacts. Could you uh, stop sharing your, your uh, screen and maybe show it in a fuller view? Absolutely. All right. So we'll start, because it's right in front of me. We'll start again. This is one of the smaller bags. And then this is the hardtack. Kind of looks like a typical cracker you would see today. Let's see if I can focus. There we go. Typical crack to see today, very thick, Extreme, extremely hard. It's dip this in coffee for sure. All right, and then here we have the uh, haversack. So you can get kind of an idea of how big that is. And then I try not to spill everything out of it. Could carry a variety of items. Uh, this is another bag that is holding coffee. Um, I have other small dishware items in here. So another essential item to the soldier's load. Did they carry pots and pans or, or just, just a silverware and, and plate? And Basically coffee? not huge pots and pans like we would kind of think of today, kind of just smaller dishware. They could put stuff a pie in. plate. Basically, yeah, about the same size. So basically a plate, smaller bowl. And they could do any cooking they with these here. All right. This big boy, this is going to be your knapsack, about 50 pounds. And then when the gum blanket, when I brought it up, the gum blanket was just kind of uh, inside of it in that middle section. Mm -hmm. um, and then this was worn kind of just like a backpack, 50 pounds of weight, most likely. And then this is the gum blanket. So yeah, it could be used spread out on the ground. It could also be used as a poncho, which was very common. Um, like I mentioned, it's absolutely pouring outside today in Virginia. So definitely would uh, appreciate something like that today. Did they carry individual tents or was it a shelter half? 
Um, it depended. It was more likely a shelter half, kind of just that L shaped. Um, and they would also roll that up and kind of place it on top of their knapsack. I have a question. Um, sure. How did they start the, the fire so they could cook things? That is a great question. Um, I'm actually not sure. I imagine it's steel, it would be, probably. Yeah, Flint? steel kind of uh, starting Flint? a spark that way. Flint, yeah. Flint, yes, that was a word I was looking for, yeah. So they would just do that basically in camp. Um, this is going to be your brogan boot. So as you can see, it is mostly straight lace, so not fitted for the right or the left foot. And then we have the pegging on the underside. So this was all uh, manufactured and then issued to soldiers. Maybe it was the right size, it probably wasn't though. So also made of leather and like talked about, not the most sturdy, got worn down really, really easily and was no match for the mud of Civil War battlefield. And there must be a, a whole industry behind them, like the people who, prepared the food and delivered it under fire and um, you know made all this stuff. Yeah, so mostly when it was being delivered, like the food, any extra supplies that was probably being made from friends and family back home. Um, there were women of, who mostly had someone who was fighting in the war. So husband, father, brother, someone you're courting um, who would uh, make food for you, Maybe they would stop by the camps. Um, that also happened on occasion. Um, normally when they were issued uh, uniforms, it was maybe one per year. And again, if you're wearing a single pair of socks every single day, they're gonna get pretty worn down. Um, so they definitely relied on friends and family back home to help get more supplies as they were walking and fighting a little bit more. What did they use to keep those socks up? <laughs> You know, I think they, since they wore the long pants, they kind of just stayed up that way. But yeah, these are incredibly long. Yeah, they are. They're, they're to keep yeah. you warm. Well, yeah, I get that. Warm. Um, and definitely not all that cool in the summer. So. No. But yes. Um, my favorite. The sword. So we take the sheath off of it. I can hold it a little bit better. I promise it's not all that sharp. So I'm not. Oh, that would be a saber, correct? Yes. So you can kind of see, I'll get it to focus. Yeah, there we have the E pluribus unum. And on the other side, we have the US. And there it is. Yeah. Love my camera focus. There we go. And then it also has US, like trying not to stab my computer, right there. So very, very ornate. Okay. Since a couple people in my class are actually anthropology degree, uh, they hold anthropology degrees and, and archaeology and artifacts are of great interest. I just yeah. have to ask the question, where did you obtain, how did your museum obtain all these actual artifacts? Were they donated, were they purchased? Usually, so for our teaching collection, I believe most of them were purchased. Um, we also do a variety of donations. Um, a lot of the artifacts in the permanent collection in the galleries are going to be ones that were donated. Um, so it's usually a combination of donations and purchasing. I'm not sure of the exact, numbers though. I have a um, old, it's supposed to be a officer's camp chair. Ooh. And I mean, I've had this thing for years. Um, yeah, I, I, at some point I need to donate it to somebody if they would want it. <laughs> How would you go about doing that? Finding yeah, out? So, yeah, so you would want to contact the collections team here at the Army Museum. Um, I believe their information is going to be on the website, but you can also just contact us generally and they should be able to get you in contact with those people. And they'll be interested. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, definitely like just that. from your reaction, I can see that. I'm, I'm a huge collections person. Um, I, yeah, like I mentioned in my 
introduction, I am a museum studies uh, master's degree candidate. Um, week away from finishing my degree. So it's kind of, I get very, very excited over collection. So I'm very happy I could talk with you guys today and be able to show off some of this stuff. Um, this is all reproduction stuff. So it's not original to the time period, which is not why I'm wearing gloves or any of that. Um, but we do have a lot of the real stuff in our permanent collections. Uh, speaking of, of the real stuff, um, would you mind sharing your screen and going through your website for us? Sure, let me bring up my National Army Museum. There we go. So this is our main website. So here you can get information about uh, the National Army Museum as well. If you guys are ever in Virginia, do come and stop by. Um, tickets, exhibits, we do have, uh, so this is our Preserving the Nation one, which is directly on the Civil War. Uh, this is a picture of the gallery here. You can get kind of a general overview. Here's some of the artifacts. Um, we got a cap, um, soldier profiles as well. You can read more stories of soldiers. Um, a big thing that we do here at the Army Museum is emphasize that every soldier has a story. Um, so this is a really great resource um, for you guys to explore. You said tickets, so are, do you charge for that? No, they're they're free tickets, they're just timed. I see. Yeah. Okay. And the museum, is it at Fort Belvoir or? Yep, so room? in Fort Belvoir, we're off post, so you don't have to go through. The, um, the security. Yeah. yeah, we have general museum security, but it's none of the showing your military ID. Mm -hmm. you kind of yeah, we're open seven point? days a week, 364. Could you kind of maneuver through the website so we can kind of get familiar with it? Absolutely. So I'll go back kind of to the main page. It's going to kind of give you an overview daily, nine to five. Free entries is where you'd get. You can also see uh, programs that we have, general uh, visitor information. Here's a map of it. Uh, these are upcoming events that we have. So we do uh, battle briefs, we do history talks. A lot of these are going to be in person as well as virtual. Um, so if you can't make it to the lovely state of Virginia, you can still participate. Um, you can do all that through uh, public programs. So if we just go to that, you can register for those here. All right, more of our, you guys may be interested in the digital resources. Um, so we have articles um, about various topics throughout Army history, um, as well as biographies, lesson plans, Heritage Month resources, um, lots of different stuff to explore. Can you stop there for a second? Uh, can you look at the biographies? I'd like to see at least a sample of one. Sure. And how are these? Are these are these donated through the descendants? Do the descendants write the story of the life, or do you guys write the story of the life? We we write them. Life? So it's a uh, museum staff that have done it. Um, so we've done research, um, all that to write these stories. Um, organized alphabetically, so we can go pull up. Uh, let's do Clara Barton. So this is hers. We have pictures, we have, I'm just gonna quickly go through this. And then each of these biographies will also have who wrote it, um, as well as sources that you guys can explore to help with your resource journey. Kirsten, are you familiar with the, uh, both the Sons of Union Veterans as well as the Daughters of Union Veterans um, organizations, their uh, lineage societies? And uh, uh, they have kind of a similar thing on their websites where you can uh, log in and look at the biography of a particular soldier. Oh, very interesting. I'm not familiar with those. I know the Daughters of the American Revolution, um, but I haven't heard of those ones. So that's, that's very good to know as I continue to do my own research. Yeah. Or anything you guys are interested in? Uh, yeah, just kind of play around with, you know, navigating through the website so we can see more parts of it. Sure. So they're going to be the exhibits. These are various 
various events that we have. Um, so you can kind of explore this. This is all um, on-site stuff that's happening, but you'll also be able to see any uh, virtual stuff that we're doing. So virtual gallery talks, you don't have anything coming up right now. Um, various news articles, us generally in the news um, when we opened, all that fun stuff. Um, if you guys are interested in becoming members, donating, you can do that here, artifact donations. Um, so when you're donating your officer's camp chair, this kind of gives you general information of how to do that. Let's see, uh, directions and parking. If you are planning on coming on site, how to get tickets, our museum stores, very fun as well. And yeah, this is back to our education page. All that fun stuff, education programs. We do a lot of different things. For you guys to explore, this is our learning center. When you guys are on site, definitely come check it out. Come say hi to me. That's where I spend a lot of my time. And then yeah, our digital resources as well. And do you have like any actual um, records from soldiers of the Civil War? Do you have like letters from uh, from soldiers of the Civil War? You know, what kind of like direct genealogical items might you carry? That's a great question, yeah. So we do have some letters. I don't believe we have a way to kind of search them through our website through a collection search. Um, the best way to probably get in contact about that would be through the website. Um, See where you can do that. Yeah, I know we have letters because we have a few of them in the exhibits, um, but I don't believe we directly have a way to search them on the website. You'd probably have to reach out to one of the curators here. There is a question in the chat box about is there a handout? Uh, a general handout for this program? Uh -huh. Um, I do not have one right off the bat, but I can contact Jen and see if she can get you kind of a summary of everything that we talked about. Oh, okay, that'd be great. I'll, I'll pass yeah. it on to the students when I send them the links for today's class. Absolutely. The, the letter I have, uh, it says the original letter is with the Garcelin family papers in the Edmund Muskie Archives and Special Collections at Bates College. So that's where my original is. So they're all over. Yeah, they can they can be all over the place. What about photographs? Do you, I mean, I, I see that on the profiles you have some photographs, but do you have like a photographic collection? Um, I believe we do. Um, I've never seen it, um, but we do have general photographs in in the collections. So if anyone wanted to find out if their ancestors among it, they just reach out to the museum? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So can you look up somebody for us? Um, I can just pull up this person here. No, I don't really have a way to search like photographic collections or letter collections or any of that. I kind of only have general soldier profiles on our website. Oh, okay. Because I have a relative that I know is there. Can you show them, uh, can you show the class on your website how to reach out to you if they have a question like, do you have my ancestors photograph? Sure, yeah. So if you go to the website here, thenamusa.org, scroll down to the bottom. There's contact. Mm. And so this can kind of lead you through. That general um, email will help you get in contact with who you need to. Just out of curiosity, um, my Civil War ancestor uh, actually got his kidneys damaged from carrying his backpack. Oh, um, wow. I, I would assume you know, and I only know this because of uh, his Civil War records through the National Archives. Mm -hmm. uh, mentioned it. Um, but I would assume that a lot of soldiers left the service, you know, not necessarily with injuries from the war itself, 
but from injuries dealing with what they had to, you know, to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, like sure, that, sure, yeah, problems. Yeah, sure, yeah, so medical issues are definitely going to be um, a real, real issue, and they kind of didn't have a whole idea of germs as well as yeah, kidney issues as well. So when you research it the medical developments that came out of the Civil War are also interesting in and of themselves. Yeah, I have one that talks about, they talk about his feet and how, um, yeah, how, how that caused a problem and he ended up like being out of service for a while and then he went back once they healed up. Right. It was a lot of dysentery as well. Yeah. An awful lot, a majority of the folks had a dysentery. Lot of and a lot of your union soldiers evidently were sickened just by, you know, because they weren't used to the what pathogens that are in the waters in the south, et cetera. Water perfect. Water yeah. purification wasn't a thing. Right. No, it wasn't. Yeah. And the mosquitoes, they weren't they weren't quite used to those either. Right. Randall, I see you have your hand up. Did you have a question for the guest speaker? Well, actually, actually I had uh, some information to give you guys. Uh, this weekend, I found an excellent spot for a number of lineage societies like this, and I put them and I put the link into the chat box. Uh, okay. One one of them is uh, heredity uh, heredity.us uh, directory online, mm -hmm. and uh, an excellent resource to try to find stuff like that. And for the one lady that was wanting to wanting to donate a chair. You might want to consider looking at um, our local groups here, like uh, Sons and Daughters of the uh, Union Veterans of the Civil War, the American Legion. There's a number of places in here that actually have local museums, and they maintain things like that. So that might be a consideration as well. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Now, Kristen, I imagine yeah, especially the shoes and the socks, like you said, the, the socks were kind of knitted at home. How yep. did those at home get the socks to the soldiers? Yeah, so there was a little bit of a mail system, but also those family members could personally travel. Um, typically, if you were a single woman, you had that capability to travel. Um, so that was basically the main way they could have done it uh, if it wasn't through mainstream supply lines. Yeah, I had a letter where one of the... Um... Uh, a family member or something wrote that another soldier had been home visiting, so she sent supplies back with him for her son or whatever it was. I don't remember now, but. Yeah, that was very common. So if a shoe, if shoes wore out, I understand if socks wore out, you know, you could get some from home. But when the shoes were out, were the soldiers out, you know, were they, if, if, the, if needed, would they be replaced? Um, typically, uh, they would probably have to purchase them themselves if they were not reissued. Um, it kind of just depended on where they were, if the supplies were available, if they could get to them. Uh, so it depended on a variety of factors. Were they charged for their clothing and supplies like they were in the Revolutionary War? Um, not to my knowledge, they were mostly a uh, standard issue um, over certain periods of time. This was different from the American Revolution where they were basically supplying themselves, um, each individual colony. But once they got to the Civil War, it was a little bit more organized, not by much, but a little bit more. Could you tell us more about the commemorative uh, bricks? Are, are those um, in memory of um, uh, just Civil War or other periods? The commemorative bricks outside of the museum? Um, I, I assume so. You were showing it on a tab. Yeah, so the commemorative bricks, those are all purchased by uh, contributors to the museum. So it could be um, individual uh, infantries, regiments in memory of someone. Um, those are all people who have bought bricks to be displayed outside of the museum. Are bricks still for sale? I believe so. Yes, I believe they're still taking them. Um, that's going to be through the foundation. 
I believe they still do it. And you can also contact the foundation as well. Oh, that might be something that the union uh, daughters and the union um, sons of the Civil War might be interested in purchasing a, a brick to yeah. their, their chapter. Or their yep, chapter. that's all going to be through the Army Historical Foundation, so you'll want to get in contact with them. Oh, well, Dave, that might be something your, your, your uh, local chapter might be interested in doing. I'll bring it up to my local chapter of union daughters. So I assume that's tax deductible since it's a 5013C? Um, I'm not sure. Um, since that is the foundation, I don't, I would think so, but I don't want to say for sure. Okay, yeah, I assume it probably is. Okay. Uh, well, any other questions uh, for our guest speaker today? Give it a few seconds here, Kirsten. Sure. Let me just check the chat box to make sure nothing came in after I. Last check here, hold on. Did you say that the brogan changed in style over the Civil War, um, making it higher and more like a, a true boot coming Since up? Since the Revolutionary yeah. War, they basically stayed the standard style throughout the entirety of the Civil War, but they're very different um, from the ones of the Revolutionary War. I've had uh, actually small children described to me as dress, uh, church shoes. <laughs> By, by the time of the Civil War, they kind of got to be this kind of high, almost boot-like looking style. Okay, George, I see you have your hand up. Uh, yes, uh, sorry, I had to join a little late. You Hopefully you haven't already discussed this, but uh, I was earlier today, I was uh, telling my daughter about this presentation because she was in the army. And she said, she she thought that almost all army bases had their own museum. Is that correct? I mean, I'm, obviously that's not the same as yours, which is kind of more comprehensive, but is, is she correct? Or, or do all army bases have like a museum just kind of pertaining to their base? I can't speak to all army posts. Um, some of them may have a very small kind of collection that they may display. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't been on too many army bases because I'm an Air Force family. Oh, okay. <laughs> Air Force family side um, that it, it definitely depends on the base. Sometimes they'll have small stuff dedicated to regiments or people who have visited. Um, but there's so I can't they speak. They, they don't always have them. And, and no, there's no coordination. But many do. Yeah. Because okay. once a, once a museum is established, a part of the funding goes through the the government. Okay. The government has to fund a lot of those those independent. Uh, museums apparently there's no like coordination between the national army museum and like lo other ones at, at various bases or anything there is not no, i doubt it museum very system much. or anything like that okay, no, okay thank you. good question george um anybody mm -hmm. else give it a few seconds person sure Uh, let's see if there's anybody else with their hand up here. Hold on. George, did you have another question? I see your hand is still up. Oh, no. Okay. Sorry, right. oh. I forgot to put it down. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. All right. Well, if there's no more questions, Kirsten, I'll say thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. It was very educational. We really appreciate it. And um, uh, please uh, let Jennifer know we missed her today, and uh, hopefully uh, we can reconnect with her at a presentation later on. And uh, just before I say goodbye, um, I want to let everyone know that the class does go on after our guest speaker is done. So I'd like to invite all of you uh, to stay. And if you are going to leave at this point in time, and once again, I hope you all stay, but if you're going to leave, um, I hope that um, you enjoyed today's class. And uh, if, you, if there's anything in the chat box that you want to download before you leave, please download the chat box now. You do that by clicking on the three little dots at the bottom of the chat box. Uh, because once you log off, even if you log back in, uh, the chat box will not be available to you. So please download it before you leave. Uh, and with that, um, uh, Kirsten, I'll go ahead and stop the recording. And once again, thank you very, very much. Of course. Thank you guys so much for having me. Y'all have a wonderful. You have a great day. You too. Bye-bye.